All right, we're at the new Breckenridge Brewery. This is a, uh, I'm here with Groovy TV, and uh, we're going to be talking about Denver Comic Con. This is our third, fourth year in a row uh, doing this event, and I can't wait to uh, talk to my man here and tell him all the things going on, uh, not only with my artwork, but with the show as well. So let's rock it. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Hey, this is Groovy. I'm here with the legendary Monty, Monty Moore. <laughs> Iconic. Right. Locally. Oh. Locally. Locally. No, actually, you're, you're, you're pretty damn legendary, actually. <laughs> We're at the Breckenridge Brewery talking about Denver Comic Con. How the heck you doing, man? I'm doing awesome. I'm just back from uh, uh, Scotland and some other travels. We've got the Denver Comic Con coming up and uh, a couple other cons after that. Uh, so no complaints. And I got a lot of irons in the fire as always with uh, new projects and products uh, in the industry and, and things that I'm doing on my own as well. Yeah, so. I can't even keep up with what you do all the time. Like, uh, <laughs> Besides the traveling, like your art, motorcycles, there's so much you do. Oh yeah, I've got a, a 1960 hot rod going right now with a Harley Quinn on it. Uh, I've got another Harley Davidson painting after that. I'm doing covers for Lady Death, covers for Cave Woman. Uh, I've got movie projects in the works, uh, other uh, some other ventures coming out, so we can talk about all that. But yeah, I you know I like to think of myself a little bit as the kind of the Renaissance man of old, which was they did a bit of everything. So mm -hmm. if you looked at uh, Da Vinci and some of these other guys, you know they were inventors, but they were also into medicine and they studied the human body and they were artists and you know sometimes they would write music and right. so as an artist I like to be involved in a lot of different things and and a lot of artists aren't like that they like to focus they they find that one th good thing that they're they're really focused at and and they'll pursue that with you know unrelenting passion and I do the same thing but it's more of a a little bit of a shotgun approach right. because that way I always stay busy you know you're, oh, yeah. you're doing a motorcycle one day and the next day you're painting a mural and then a logo for somebody or a band cover and then right. you know as an artist you don't get bored you're always challenged oh yeah yeah that's what prolific I, you are very well, prolific yeah. I might not be good but I'm <laughs> prolific actually you're very good <laughs> Because no, you, you posted some recent stuff, and I was just like blown away. Like, it, like you've been, you've been awesome all along, but your new stuff is crazy. Thank you. It, it, uh, I'm, I'm really trying to focus this year and actually slow down a bit, you know, in this sort of fast-paced world of ours where everybody always wants to be fast, you know, mm. Photoshop and things like that. It's fast, 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 fast. Mm. And I'm actually trying to say, okay, well, you know, if some of this really good work has 10, 15 hours in it, how good would it be if I had 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 hours in it? Right. So I'm actually trying to slow down and really... Uh, try to break through to that next level of quality mm -hmm. in my own artwork uh, and actually expanding a little bit with uh, the genre so I actually brought a piece that has more of a western flair to it awesome. uh, and so uh, that's one of my focuses this year is moving into uh, some you know almost museum quality uh, artwork for uh, western galleries and things like that uh, you know we live in Colorado I was born on a cattle ranch in Idaho mm -hmm. grew up doing all that kind of stuff so uh, it's just yet another kind of challenge for me, but some of the artwork, like the one I brought, I'm bringing my love of pop culture into my Western art. Awesome. So I do want to be doing some pieces with, you know, John Wayne and, and, and cool movies, Tombstone, uh, Clint Eastwood is who I brought with yeah. me. The Clint Eastwood one is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> like I've shown so many people. It's like, have you seen this thing? Let's take a look. So. Yeah. Um, the, the funny part is I, I did actually do a good portion of this in Scotland, in my hotel room. Um, and we'll probably get some wicked glare there, um, but it, we can maybe get a, a close-up shot of it afterwards. Yeah. Um, so this underdrawing, this is on a, a brown piece of uh, paper. And so the, the drawing is primarily done with uh, black barrel Prismacolor pencils. Uh, and there's a little bit of airbrushing in it. And then the white for the highlights is just done with the white pencil afterwards. Okay. So I actually call this a, kind of a fine art illustration illustration, if you yeah, will. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have to see this thing in person is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yes, you got all seven of the guys that he kind of comes up against at the end. You've got a kind of coming out of the mountains uh, on his pale horse kind of thing. And right. um, it's, uh, again, this wasn't for a client. It's just for uh, for me. It's going to be for sale to obviously a collector. For sure. uh, but then that way you're not rushed. If I want to take 15 hours on it and, and, and it's not like, oh, it's got to be done on Tuesday, then, then I can do that. And so that's kind of refreshing for me. Oh, yeah. And hopefully that'll allow me 
um, some artistic breakthroughs as well in quality because you have to push yourself as an artist. Otherwise, you're just kind of kicking the same dead horse if you're like, hey, I'm really good at this one thing. Mm -hmm. And then you just kind of do that same thing for 10 years. Right. You know, I'd be like stabbing myself in the head with a pencil if, if I wasn't you know, doing new things and trying to okay. get better at the things I'm doing. Yeah, because honestly, like, you know, now I'm trying to make films, I'm like trying to write stories, I'm doing all yeah, this other like stuff. Me. Yeah, because yeah. like, I've literally done 800 of these things <laughs> and I own the world's record for that. So, I mean. Yeah, it's impressive, <laughs> you know, very impressive in its own right, for sure. Well, you know, I, I understand where it's like, I gotta do other stuff too. Yeah, yeah, and that way you get excited about it. You know, you get up and you're like, hey, I'm gonna, you know go interview this guy or I'm gonna go over here and then you might just be driving down the road and you have an idea for a horror story or a movie or a short or something you want to do and you're like oh man I got to write that down because I think other people would enjoy that or this would be a story that needs to be told right. and so um, on a couple of my recent trips overseas because I had time while I was traveling I, I forced myself to get back into some writing okay. and so um, actually since January I've written two new screenplays nice. uh, one is a uh, uh, limited location horror called Newton's Law, okay. uh, which uh, uh, it's kind of along the veins of like Saw and Mine Hunters and things like that. Uh, you're not necessarily sure what you see is what you get. Right. Um, and actually, it's being considered for option right now by a, a production company, a producer in uh, Australia. And then uh, I also wrote uh, the first episode for Loco Hero, which is a project I think I discussed with you last year yeah. that was my own kind of. I want to call it a superhero concept, uh, but it's a it's a female character, Latina, mm -hmm. ex-military, uh, but she's homeless, and you you don't you know it's the opposite of Batman. Batman's this you know uber wealthy, has all these gadgets and stuff, and and it's more about the the core of the hero. She doesn't have any cool gadgets, and she doesn't have any uh, you know unlimited wealth or anything like right. that. Yes, uh, Batman's not going to be in a soup kitchen anytime soon. Right, and that's actually where the, the main story is kind of set in the soup kitchen yes. kind of setting where she volunteers, okay. um, and but she thinks she's a superhero. So that's why it's called Loco Hero. She okay. has some head damage and some trauma and things like that. So she's a little bit crazy. Um, <laughs> awesome. And uh, doing all the, the right things maybe for the wrong reasons. Okay. Um, but only, they're not wrong to us. They're just wrong in her head. <laughs> Um, so I, it's, uh, it's quite a bit different writing for uh, episodic TV, mm -hmm. which is something I haven't done before. I've written 10 screenplays, but there was just single feature films. Right. And so um, I actually had to do quite a bit of reading uh, and research and take copious notes so that I could get the pacing and the, the length and all that sort of thing. Because it, it's quite a bit different trying to have characters that could last 100 episodes of a show yeah. as opposed to, woo, we wrapped it up 100 pages and here's who I killed and here's still who's alive. Um, and so it uh, felt really good to, cool. to get that done. And uh, I'm actually hoping to go to LA uh, at the end of the month and interview with uh, some literary agents. Awesome. Uh, hoping to uh, find a good fit for, for me as well as them uh, mm -hmm. to possibly get some of my writing and my artwork uh, represented where people could come to me uh, with a concept and say, hey, we, we want this alien movie and you can also draw it or design it and I could even be the art director on the project on the project mm -hmm. um, that would be my sort of like you know kind of dream goal with that yeah. like working in film uh, I think you're going to achieve <laughs> that and uh, and then uh, uh, last night I was actually working on some some other concepts some production partners are out there they're actually meeting with some companies to do some pitches mm -hmm. just real kind of quick pitches of concepts and some of them are along the lines of sci-fi channel and things like that you know one of them I came up with was the uh, orcupine which is an orca porcupine you know, it's a giant orca, but it actually can shoot these, like, awesome quills, you know. <laughs> that is genius. My God, that is genius. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I'm, I'm having fun with that. Uh, and then I have two, uh, two scripts that are under option okay. uh, currently. Uh, one of them is uh, Blood and Bullets, uh, which I am working with an artist in Brazil, Leonardo Gondim, uh, who's doing the pencils, and we're turning that into a, a comic book. Okay. And it's also under an option, and that's a vampire western. Okay. Uh, which is cool. And then Cutter, uh, which is a, a kind of an ongoing, it's a horror project that's been under option for a few years. And uh, hopefully they're getting pretty close to their financing and might move that, uh, get that move forward into production. Right uh, on. So that feels pretty good. You know? you're, like I said, you're a busy, busy guy. 
<laughs> I don't sleep a lot, but you know, it's just because it's not productive. <laughs> Although I am 45 now, so I try to sleep a little more than I used to when I was in my 20s. <laughs> Naps are your friend. <laughs> okay, so at Comic Con, are you going to have a, the big bitchin' booth again, the monster? Even bigger. Even bigger, yes. Yeah. So this is actually going to be my, uh, my biggest booth yet that I've ever had in 25 years of doing shows. So I'm actually going to have a, a, a 20 by 20, so it'll be 400 square feet. Uh, and my nephew is going to be helping me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be bringing more stuff than I've ever taken to any convention because wow. I have the space and room for it. And one of the portions of the... Uh, of the booth is what I call the pop culture corner. And this is kind of new for me and it's, it's not my artwork, it's not my products, it's stuff that I think is cool. And it's Game of Thrones and Arrow and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Doctor Who and you know a lot of these kind of properties. Yeah. And so what I do, because I go to a lot of shows and I see a lot of cool stuff, and it's not always at these other conventions where I find it online, you know, I buy it at wholesale and I'm bringing it to Denver uh, for fans to have it. So it could be, you know, Funko toys or uh, it could have a tie-in with something that I have done. Okay. But, you know, if I see uh, a mother aliens, you know, cool maquette, well, I didn't design it, but it's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to have to have a couple of those to offer. And... Um, so I am going to have one portion of my booth, and I, and I already have, I think, 150 products on my website. And it's just called the Pop Culture Corner, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just sort of offerings through me That's yes, you can find it other places on the web, but it's going to be right there for people, same price. You know, just regular retail kind of stuff. Awesome. Um, but I think people react well to it, uh, and it allows sometimes uh, for some low-priced items. So say somebody has that that five-dollar budget, or that ten-dollar budget, and they want to get something cool. They may not be able to get one of my prints or uh, an original, obviously, and that sort of thing. But I don't want them to go away empty-handed. So I want to be able to have things in that price range and that appeal. Where if if a mom says, "Well, I need something for a ten-year-old," you know, oh man, I got the perfect perfect thing for you, you know, here you go. Right and, and so I, I like that feeling of being able to offer something, even if I'm not the guy who was smart enough to create it. <laughs> uh, and then uh, right now I'm actually opening uh, a shop on Threadless. Are you familiar with Threadless? Yeah. Okay, so I did their heavy metal poster contest recently, okay. and that kind of introduced me to their print-on-demand kind of technology. And people have been asking me for years, you know, how come you don't have your artwork on shirts and all these products? And you know, it mostly has to do with sizes. We're all different size people. And to not me. Yeah, this is Mr. Three X here. <laughs> um, so, you know, to take that stuff to cons, you know, I'm not styling online where I'm bringing in, you know, semi loads of this stuff. So, um, what I'm going to do is just offer where people can go to my store on their site. Mm -hmm. And I hope to have 10, 20 designs on there uh, soon. Uh, and you'll be able to say, hey, I want a baseball sleeveless, or I want a hat, or I want a v neck, or, you know, whatever yeah. your style is. Um, you can get your size, pick your color, all that, and then have my artwork on it. Awesome. And uh, so, that I think that's going to work pretty well. Uh, so, I, I'm going to promote that a little bit at the show just with maybe some samples and some postcards uh -huh. and then people can go to the show afterwards and right. pick out their their stuff that they like right. um, what, what are your booth numbers do you know uh, for it's either 447 or 477. The cool part is I'm, I'm right off the edge of Artist Alley, okay. but there's a bunch of uh, great other booths and publishers near me. Uh -huh. And so I'm near uh, Zenoscope, I'm near Top Cow. Wow. Uh, the Incredible Art Gallery is just across the aisle from me. Okay. And uh, they have a, a killer gallery downtown and they carry Marvel and DC and Star Wars and all that. Awesome. And they have some of my originals as well. Okay. Uh, so I am an artist that's, that's represented there. And they're gonna have a 40 foot booth right there. So. Um, you, you look at some of the um, some of the booths and the size, and now our show is starting to attract these great publishers. It might only been a couple of years that maybe Zenoscope or some of these other publishers are there. Mm -hmm. And even though we don't have you know Marvel and DC showing up, for the most part they only show up at like. San Diego and New York, right. you know, that sort of thing. Um, They'll start showing up at some point. Well, you know, we're fourth, fifth biggest in the country. I mean, we're over 100,000 attendees. You know how long it took San Diego to, to hit that mark? 25, 30 years, you know. And, and we obviously live in a different time and everything's a lot faster. But to hit that mark in four or five years, yeah. I'm pretty blown away. I used to run a show here in Denver and about four or 500 people would show up and that was it. <laughs> that was called the 90s. <laughs> 
So um, I'm super proud of the show that um, that we have here. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, speaking of that, I got a little let's, preview here. Yeah, let's uh, let's see some stuff. I'm gonna have a sip of my 471. Absolutely. Um, so this is the original illustration for um, this might even be on the program cover I know it's offered on a shirt it's gonna be a poster so this was actually drawn by uh, George Genty another artist so he did the kind of cartoon anime uh, style illustration and then the the con asked me to do the the color illustration uh, and obviously since I'm not uh, big into digital coloring I like to I like to be able to actually hold this so this is not a print you know this is actually the original illustration awesome. um, that uh, that this will be available to show, and I just I love the funness and the whimsical. We got mm -hmm. the you know uh, Captain Kit, sort of Kid Colorado, and kids in cosplay here, and and I love the fact that they've actually been able to combine this sort of like Walking Dead <laughs> zombie kid. I mean, how can you combine that? any cooler than this because most people would freak out if you were like hey kid zombies that's a no-no you know uh, but to sort of pull it off like this I was just it was super fun um, and then uh, there's actually going to be a set of uh, uh, Hard Rock Cafe does uh, pins for the con every year okay. and so um, I also did the the sort of coloration on those and some of the promotional illustrations that are on the Facebook page and the website uh, were colored by me even though I'm not coloring with a computer they're they're sort of illustrated slash painted I see. Yeah. Okay, cool. um, so that's fun, and, and I'm super proud to be continue to be a part of the show. And I see you have uh, you're conti continuing with my uh, future ex-wife series. Yeah, yeah. Well, every year I got to bring a new a new temptation for you. <laughs> um, so this is uh, this is a piece I recently did for. Um, uh, a book called Gods and Goddesses, okay. and all the artists just contributed their own time uh, to the project, which was on Kickstarter. Uh, and so uh, I did two illustrations for it. One was a, a druid; the character was Druancha, mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, my version of Isis. So trying to give a little uh, power back to uh, Isis. You know, she's had her power stolen <laughs> by uh, you know uh, crummy people on the other side of the world who were uh, doing bad stuff and uh, kind of stole her name. So um, this is the original illustration. But what's kind of fun. Uh, about that is uh, in my expanding line of, of products and stuff mm -hmm. is uh, gaming mats. And so if you want to hold that side. Oh, yeah. um, so this is, uh, you know, it's almost like a giant kind of mouse pad. Uh, and these are gaming mats. But people will also use them, you know, even if they're not magic players. You know, put your keyboard on it and things like that kind of dresses up your workstation. And so, uh, so I brought that. Uh, and then another one that you probably saw on Facebook, um, which turned out really nice. This is another uh, recent illustration. This is called Queen of Winter Dragons. And the model that I was working with, um, actually she had contacted me through Facebook and liked my art. And she's the 50th anniversary playmate for Playboy. Oh, wow. And she's also a professional DJ and she likes fairies and uh, really cool mystical stuff. So I kind of worked with her with some ideas. And this is the second piece I've done with her. Uh, the first one was a steampunk DJ piece oh, wow. uh, painting that's that cool. turned out really sweet. Uh, and one of the things that's nice about doing your own artwork meaning it's not uh, Daredevil it's not Deadpool you know uh, a, a recent character Marvel or DC because mm -hmm. I can do whatever I want with these images and, right. and sometimes I think that that's the, the current trend of artists to do a lot of fan art which has kind of taken over you know Facebook and a lot of groups and even in a lot of conventions and and some artists were, were kind of starting to push back from it and say hey it's getting a little out of control Nobody's monitoring this. Everybody's making a few bucks off of, you know, Marvel or whatever. And, and, and we've all done pieces. I have portfolio pieces that, you know, I've done of Gwen Stacy or Batman or something mm -hmm. because you want to show those as samples to get notice and interest right. but there's some guys who you know are trying to make sort of a little cottage industry out of you know cranking out these prints so right. uh, I'm actually starting to kind of uh, sway the opposite way from that and kind of trying to focus on my own creations because then I can legally you know put them on shirts I can license that for a puzzle uh, you know a clock it doesn't matter what the the product is and so um, I hope other artists kind of pay attention to that and are trying to create their own images and their mm -hmm. own characters uh, because that's really what the, the industry was founded on. Right. You know, oh, yeah, wh sure. what if Brian Polito hadn't created Lady Death or uh, Joe Lindsner not created Dawn, you know, mm -hmm. then the industry would be so much smaller. We wouldn't have all these great characters and creations uh, because people said, oh, well, I'm only going to draw Superman for the rest of my life. Yeah. You're like, hey, you know, what, what's in your brain? Come up with something new. Uh, push yourself. And right. uh, so I like a lot of the fact that a lot of indie artists and indie publishers today all over the world um, are 
uh, you know, kind of, you know, starting to come out of that and, and push in their own, um, I shouldn't That's say what we need. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, because I mean, uh, everything is being rehashed endlessly. It seems like no matter what, and it, like if, I, I, I used to think it would be a dream for me to have Marvel and DC movies come out every freaking month. Guess what? <laughs> now it's like it's like oh dear God, movie at what? Two in the theater at once right now. Uh, <laughs> and like. Uh, like X Men Three was so bad, just ruined my childhood. This is like I'm not even gonna go to this one. <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, I had this exact conversation with a friend of mine, and and I did actually go see the uh, recent uh, the recent X Men, because um, uh, you know I'm a fan and I'm curious, and actually I think th I thought they did a nice job. I I enjoyed it, mm -hmm. and there's been some really great movies that have helped our industry. They've helped us as artists. You know, we're looked at as people who are part of a really cool industry now mm -hmm. and 10 20 years ago it was not it's like hey comic books whoa you must be a nerd <laughs> and we used to you know uh, make jokes when we go to San Diego Comic Con that the you know the owners around there would say you know oh yeah guess what the nerds are coming in town this week and now it's like <laughs> praise lord they're coming because it's this you know giant weekend that's worth millions and everybody has a blast and people are dressed up the bartenders are dressed up you go anywhere in town every Everybody is into it yeah. um, and it's not just this under the table kind of thing like oh you guys read comic books or you're not it's like guess what Hollywood finally turned into the fact that you know there's some great content out there mm -hmm. but I on the flip side of that I read an article this week that was that was kind of saying is is Hollywood ruining movies and things like that by only focusing on these giant tent pole Right. Uh, films based on these high-profile characters right. uh, and and will there be a chance for things that there used to be like the mask and men in black and road mm -hmm. to perdition uh, sin city you know things that were maybe uh, lesser known uh, uh, stories that were still great on their own and and don't get me wrong there's been bad movies all along the way you had to get to this point where they said well we're willing to roll the dice on a hundred million dollar superhero film right um, but there but there's all that glitz and glam attached to it just, and, just don't just quit ruining Fantastic Four <laughs> It's it's hard <laughs> to I don't I don't even know what to do with Fantastic Four. I love Doug Jones because he's my man. But their uh, movies uh, the movies have been horrible. There's not been one good Fantastic Four film. Yeah, <laughs> Doug, you're awesome. By the way, love you. But <laughs> it, but the other parts could have been better. And and it had great ingredients. So sometimes you have to look at something and say individually that a lot of these actors are. Uh, are are great, yeah. right? They're all doing great things. I mean, it, it's interesting to look back and say that Johnny Storm actually turned into Captain America. You're like, why did you cast the same the same <laughs> character in two movies? But now we don't. People don't even hardly remember that. Yeah. They think of him as 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 Steve Rogers. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So you know, I, I think you need to kind of find a balance between uh, you know making good films and not overlooking indie filmmakers smaller films uh, thank goodness for technology is pretty affordable these days mm -hmm. that all of us with a movie camera and a Mac you know set up you can make go make great content mm -hmm. uh, and it comes down to you know story and production and and that and there's uh, you know there's some low-budget movies along the way that have you know really put Hollywood on its ear oh, and, it, no. and it's nice on occasion when that happens uh, but right now we're sort of in this polished uber money big you know roll the dice and if this movie flops you know your company's toast because <laughs> yeah. they're you know because so many of the sort of eggs are in one basket uh -huh. um, well hopefully one of your movies will uh, upset the, the cart and be go nice. crazy I, you know I'm happy just to make good movies but good movies that make money would be even better <laughs> um, so I have to ask you though since sure. we're talking a little bit about movies and games mm -hmm. and art uh, and even though I never worked on the world of Warcraft based on the previews mm -hmm. what do you think I have no faith. <laughs> okay, I can't, uh, so I kind of feel the same way, and I hope it doesn't let the players down, because I have some very good friends who have spent literally years of their life, uh, you mm -hmm. know, playing this game, and, uh, and there's been some amazing artwork that's come from it, from Alex Horley and just all these other artists. And, you know, I saw the preview, and it's no Lord of the Rings. You know, there, it's so digital that to me it looks like this giant ad 
for a video game and because they went with so much digital instead of you yeah. know trying to maybe make some more practical it looks effect. like shrek in armor basically <laughs> Okay, I think you heard it here first. That is the quote of the of the day, the kind of Shrek and armor. So I'm a little leery, and uh, I'm glad I'm not the only one that felt that way because I was feeling like a schmuck that I wasn't giving it its chance. But I'd be working away, and every time the preview would come on, I'd go, "Ooh." <laughs> Here, man. You know, and there's other movies that you know you you see the preview for, and you're like, oh man, I am not missing that. Yeah. And and uh, we're obviously we're both big movie guys, oh. and uh, so I I I try to to go and support the movies in the theater because I like the theater experience. I love going to the Alamo just up the road oh. here, um, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm you know I'm just looking forward to uh, trying to get back a little into you know some of the filmmaking and the writing uh, and as you've probably guessed I'm relentless when it comes to you know pursuing something so mm -hmm. it might it might take me two years or it might take me ten but you, I, you have to I like you have to. you have to like just do I, me and my buddy Ryan keep talking about this don't think do you just yeah. keep doing do 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 it's very Yoda yeah. You know, don't don't talk about it, you know, or think about it. Just do it. Yeah. Uh, and even with the game company, you know, we, we have several games on the market for uh, Mind's Eye Games, who I'm the co-owner of. And, uh, man, it just seems like sometimes it's just, you know, obstacle after obstacle when it comes to, you know, distribution or shipping or, you know, people want the new flavor of the month as opposed to just a, you know, a solid game that who cares if it came out five or ten years ago. Still fun to play. Doesn't yeah. change. And uh, so you're always trying to overcome those uh, obstacles. And, and when we're going to our shows like Gen Con or uh, gaming conventions, you know, we're like, well, you know, we might not be, you know, first to get there, but we're, we're, we're never going to give up. We just kind of still keep chugging along. Right. right. So uh, this year we, we hope to have two new products out at Gen Con. Uh, one of them is our first gaming module, which is, you know, a kind of a, a pre-written adventure. Mm -hmm. uh, and my partner, Sean, uh, in the gaming company is fantastic uh, writer and game master. And so uh, we actually did some playing of the adventure and then he's play tested it with a bunch of his buddies. Uh, and they... Uh, uh, it's, it's just fantastic and so I recently did some of the artwork in Scotland of course uh, for the interior illustrations and I'm working on the uh, the cover now okay. uh, and then we have uh, one other project um, that we're working on that I'm not gonna let quite out of the bag yet it's got a gr it's got a great name though um, you'll hear it and you'll go oh man how come I didn't think of that <laughs> I hope because that's at least what we thought so we're working on that game as well right on. Uh, and then um, you know, one of the other things locally, too, that ties in with Denver Comic Con is the wizard chest. Uh, I don't know if you've been to the new location, I haven't. but it'll it'll make you grow hair like it. It's that cool. And yeah. uh, it's off the hook. It's right. It's right downtown off of Broadway. Okay. And uh, they have this gigantic space. I forgot how big it is, but you know, 25,000 feet or something. And you, you walk in and it's like walking into. Harry Potter meets Lord of the Rings meets Star Wars and murals on the walls, art, costuming, all this kind of stuff. And the only reason why I bring it up is uh, not only are they a sponsor of the show, they're a local business, they're great, but if you love games, if you love comics, they have a great area where people can just go and game uh, upstairs and downstairs. Uh, it's just a super fun thing. So even fans coming into town mm -hmm. owe themselves a visit because it's almost like an experience like a small you know go into a, a wizard world or something but where, where you can uh, you know buy everything from magic tricks in one corner to games and gaming but also if they want to do a little bit of costuming or something like that um, and I was I've only been down there once or twice so far okay. and um, uh, working with them to just do a couple of uh, artwork pieces and things but uh, totally totally unabashed just I think it's cool as hell because I'm a giant nerd and uh, it, it really it's a really sweet place I, I'm super proud that Denver has uh, a, a gaming so it's more than a gaming store it's just uh, I don't know it's almost like a thrill ride without the thrill without the actual physical ride <laughs> <laughs> All thrill, no ride. Uh, it is. It's a yeah. It's a lot of thrill. Uh, I mean, even if you go there and you don't buy a thing, y you will enjoy it and you'll tell your friends about it because it's just that cool. And right. uh, they used uh, some local and some out-of-state artists as well to do murals. One of the parts that you go from the upstairs to the downstairs is like the uh, labyrinth, like oh, okay. hedgerow labyrinth, and it's painted with creatures from throughout the mythology, yeah. and and just painting that whole area just to take you downstairs like most people would just have white walls no no this is off the hook so 
I, I think people will enjoy that if they're coming into town for the uh, con. I would say, you owe yourself a visit to the wizard chest. You've got to go by. <laughs> go check it out. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for Absolutely. your time. I, I appreciate being invited every year and, and uh, staying in the fold and being able to uh, tell everybody uh, all the craziness uh, that's going on. Yeah, you, you get no sleep. I know that much. <laughs> Well, I, I used to have a, when I would uh, frequent the nightclubs and things like that, and my favorite shirt that I always wore just said, I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I still kind of, you know, believe in that philosophy. Awesome. The other guy's sleeping, so I'm working. <laughs> right on. Thank right, you again so much. Right. This is Groovy. You're the legendary Monty Moore. We'll see you guys at Denver Comic Con. Brooklyn's Brewery. Bye. 2016.